Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Josie McPherson. I am the Senior Director of System Advocacy <coughs> here at the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and welcome to our webinar, Our Story, Our Truth, Women of Color, Sexual Assault Survivorship, with our presenter, Teresa Stafford. Uh, so before I turn this over to Teresa, uh, if anyone's having technical difficulties, please email me at my email, J McPherson, that's J M C P H E R S O N at Niscasa N Y S C A S A dot org. And now I'll hand it over to Teresa. Teresa, are you there? Yes, I am. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us today as we have this extremely important conversation about the survivorship of women of color. I am the Chief Advocacy Officer at Cleveland Rape Crisis Center, where I oversee teams that support survivors throughout various systems, and I also do a lot of work with these systems to make sure that they are equipped to respond to all survivors in a trauma-informed manner. So today we're, gonna, um, we're coming together so we can really understand the history of women of color as it is related to sexual violence and the anti-oppression, anti-violence movement. I and mean, then also understanding how this history has impacted individuals today, um, whether it's with regards to whether they come forward to report, uh, the support they may or may not receive, um, are our programs equipped to handle survivors of color, and how does the system respond to these ladies when they do come forward? And then as a conversation, hopefully we can get to where we're going to discuss ways to be trauma-informed and engaged when working with survivors of color while we're incorporating cultural humility. So some people, I've done this presentation probably for um, the last couple years, and periodically I get this question, so why do we focus on women of color and not all survivors? Um, I think it's really important that we have this conversation because we know historically in our country that sexual violence has been used as a tool of control, especially against women of color. Um, and by having this conversation, we can start really thinking about what practices do we currently do in our organizations that may need to be changed? What's working well? How can we advocate better for these individuals and these systems that often keep them oppressed or actually are the ones that um, manifested this oppressive behavior in the first place? And then it actually requires us to look inward and see how are we practicing humility and how do we show up as an aspiring ally for survivors of color in the work that we do every day. I think it's really important also to understand the cultural trauma that survivors of colors may have. Um, you know, cultural trauma occurs when members from these collective groups have been subjected to um, horrendous acts over long periods of time that have passed down through generations and generations. And for these group of individuals, it leaves memories on them that mark their future, uh, and it has irrevocable ways of being um, present for them when they are going through these systems or even through our rate crisis center programs to receive services. And we must talk about this. Um, it's really important that we talk about cultural trauma because if we don't, it kind of like negates a lot of the experience that people have and how they have had to move around in this world before they were victimized and post their victimization. One of the quotes I like by Robert Penn um, is like, history cannot give us a program for the future, but it can give us a fuller understanding of ourselves and our common humanity so that we can be better face the future. And to me, that just sits with the fact of, you know, we create programs to respond to survivors within our rape crisis centers, within our community-based organizations. And sometimes we look at cookie-cutter approach, like this one-size-fits-all, and what we've come to find out, and even with the work as a woman of color myself, um, providing advocacy for many years, that it's not a cookie cutter approach, that we really need that concept. When we say meet survivors where they are, we need to do that, but we also need to have an understanding about how the past may have be affecting that person in the present day. So i like to start off with talking about a little bit of historical facts with regards to some of the populations with re of women of color. Now this presentation will not be able to capture all of the different populations of women of color, but I'm going to highlight some of the few and just to give a preference that we will spend a bulk of time talking about specifically black women. With regards to our Native American women, some quick facts. What we do know is that 
Um, what's unique about uh, the Native American women is that nine out of ten victims of rape or sexual violence for this population are assaulted by someone who is non-Native American. Um, for the majority of women of color, they typically are assaulted by somebody within the race. And a lot of this might have to do with the fact that on Native land, there's still a lot of confusion about who has jurisdiction over these cases where people actually target Native women because of the lack of prosecution for their victimization. Uh, there was a report completed a couple years ago that uh, showed that the U.S. attorneys declined to prosecute um, over 60% of violent crimes against Native American women. Uh, and most of those crimes were committed by non-Native individuals. So uh, people know that they can go cause harm to these ladies without actually being held accountable. And then when you look at how many women, uh, Native women, who might be in uh, treatment programs for chemical dependency, uh, the study also shows that 90% of those individuals experience some form of sexual abuse in their lifetime. And then when we look at our Hispanic Latinas, uh, survivors, we know that a lot of these young ladies experience sexual violence within their dating intimate relationships, uh, and 7.9% of them even stated that their uh, spouse, boyfriend, or somebody victimized them uh, within their lifetime. The other thing what I think is unique from my own experience working with this population is that the number of times that they turn to um, resources within their own community, whether it was the faith-based organizations or family members, um, they were told to um, not tell anybody else, keep this in a family. Um, also, to I've had a couple young ladies that were actually told to marry their perpetrator, um, which is also really challenging for them when they may have language barriers and don't have additional resources outside of that close-knit community. Also, from back in the early 1900s, uh, there's also a lack of trust within the system for our Hispanic survivors, especially with regards to the sterilization of um, women who were forced and targeted into having being sterilized to control the population. We see in my community a low number of our survivors from the Hispanic community going forward to have forensic medical exams complete um, because of the lack of trust within the healthcare system. And as early as, as late as 2001, we saw that the Latina girls were um, from the Reed camps of California. These individuals were identified um, and rescued, um, where they were being forced to have sex and were trafficked to the farm workers. And even though these young ladies were rescued, uh, perpetrators identified, majority of the individuals avoided prosecution due to the fact that a lot of these young girls were um, not in the United States legally, and people just did not see it as a crime or because of their status chose not to prosecute. And with our Asian Pacific Islander survivors, we definitely see a lower reporting of rape uh, than um, other women of color from minority backgrounds, uh, especially because of the silence. And some of these communities don't have the appropriate language to even identify um, the terminology for what a rape is, what sexual assault is. Ironically, if you were to Google uh, rape porn, I'm not saying do that right now, but if you were to do that, uh, you would see a high number of um, those pornographic images will come back to Asian women. And if somebody is viewing that type of material over and over again, um, it will give them the idea that this is what either these ladies like or this is socially appropriate to attack them. And going even back to the Native American women, um, some of you all may remember this. I might be aging myself a little bit, but Atari created a game called Custer's Revenge um, back in the 80s. Well, Atari didn't create it. Another organization created it so it can be played through Atari gaming system. And that Custer's Revenge was basically about Colonel Custer in the war. And any time that somebody raped or killed a Native American woman, they received extra points. And when those stereotypical images are put out there in society, it just gives people a view that these women are less than and deserve less than others. And for African-American women, the Black Women's Blueprint did a study that basically showed that for every black woman that reports, there's at least 15 that don't. 
And then by the age of 16, 60% of black women have experienced some form of sexual violence. And to me, that number right there is extremely high. And if we were talking about any other thing, like 60% of, uh, of people will get um, a breast cancer by the age of 18, we would see this as a health ep epidemic. But we also know when people experience sexual violence, um, it has long-term implications on their health, on their mental status, and how productive they may or may not be in society if they're not supported correctly. This number is just extremely high. And what I will say, uh, just so you all, there's a part in the, where you can ask questions. If you have a question throughout this presentation, feel free to type it in. I will try to incorporate some of the questions as I see them um, in the conversation, uh, but I definitely will leave time at the end of the presentation for some questions. And so in order to really have this conversation, I like to have it in three sessions. I like to talk about, you know, the past um, and also talk about, you know, how the past has implications for present day and then what can we do to change the conversation. Uh, and so we have to start with the past. We can't erase the past. And as I stated earlier, um, in our country, sexual violence has been used as a weapon of domination of control the masses that typically has been targeted towards, you know, the, some of the most marginalized populations, especially when it comes to women of color. And to start that conversation, we must start first with our Native American women. Um, sexual violence was definitely used as a tool to conquest when the colonizers came over in the discovery of America. The Native children, they were forced into these boarding schools so they can assimilate into this European culture. And while they were inside of these boarding schools, those children experienced a high level of sexual victimization without anybody um, being accountable for their actions. And then what I think is also unique, which probably plays a lot into why you see um, a high number of cases against a client for prosecution, is a 1968 federal appellate rule hearing that basically stated that if somebody um, was not Native American and they uh, caused harm or committed a crime on Native land, they weren't charging them for their crime. So, I mean, this just gave people the pass to go over um, into Native land and cause harm to individuals without any accountability. And then, of course, slavery. For our African Americans who were enslaved and forced into slavery to have sex, these ladies were considered bed warmers. And as some of you may know, even before they came over to, to the United States, over in the Caribbean islands, they basically had birth implantations where they were forced to have sex with each other. The men were forced to have sex with the women. And they just birthed new babies, birthed more enslaved individuals. Um, and it's a whole book out here by Maria Jenkins Swartz that's talking about a birthing a slave, about basically how women did not have control over their bodies, and their bodies was for uh, capital gain and purposes during this time period, which you sort of see again today what's going on with human trafficking, about the high number of women of color and young girls who go missing every day. Um, I'm sure you may see it on your Facebook thread. Facebook thread. I see it constantly on mine, these young girls that are missing. Um, and at first I used to think that these young ladies were just, you know, leaving home, but through working human trafficking and discussing and having conversations with these ladies, when they come back or when they're recovered, they have been trafficked. Somebody has taken advantage of them and sold them, um, and it's basically the same thing that happened back in slavery. And we think about um, what defines rape back in the day. Um, race has historically defined what rape was in America. What we know, punishment existed only for raping a white woman. Um, it did not protect women of color, did not protect black women, um, and black men were often only punished when they raped a white woman. And we can sort of see that play out still today in various dynamics. I really like this case, um, George versus State, 1859. I'm going to read the slide to you all. I know you can see it, but I just, it has a powerful impact. The crime of rape does not exist in this state between African slaves. Our laws recognize no marital rights. As between slaves, their sexual intercourse is left to be regulated by their owners. The regulations of law as to the white race 
on the subject of sexual intercourse do not and cannot, for obvious reasons, apply to slaves. Their intercourse is promiscuous, and the violation of a female slave by a male slave would be a mere assault and battery. So I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, do any of you all possibly see this case, State versus George in 1859, playing out in 2018? That's the opportunity. If you see this with the cases that you're working in your community plan out, you can type it into the question area. And what I will say, when I did this training with my team, yes, yeah, sex among people is viewed as a deviant. In my, I cannot see on my screen. A sex among people of color is viewed as deviant in modern day slavery. Yes, modern day in America. Yes. I also say when I uh, did this training with the advocates on my team, uh, they immediately thought about how many times when they go to court and they're advocating for a survivor of color that oftentimes that case is pled down um, to something. Originally it was indicted as a rape or a sex offense, and then all of a sudden it's an assault. It's an aggravated assault. It's um, uh, unruly conduct. Uh, it's pled all the way down to something, and it doesn't even mirror the reason why that individual is in court. Uh, ironically, one of our judges here in my county did a big study about um, all of the cases that flee off of the sex offense tree. And when you look at the race behind it, a lot of times uh, the victim was a woman of color, and the charge that the individual pled to was assault, which basically was the bar fight type of assault, which stated that the victim provoked their victimization. And what we know is that historically, women of color are often blamed for their own victimization, that they said if they didn't do this, then they wouldn't have been assaulted. And it goes into that stereotype of the Jezebel image, um, that this person is hypersexualized, and this is why um, that they were assaulted. And so when we talk about after slavery and move into silence after emancipation during the Jim Crow laws of the Deep South, during this time period um, of the Jim Crow era, Silas still remained a tool of survival for women of color. Um, women were being gang raped at a high level. The lynching of black men was happening, um, which actually overshadowed the uh, rape of black women. Women were taught first, yet, you know, you are black first and women second, that we must do everything we can to protect our men uh, during this time period because of the lynching. And then the other thing of it is, is that sometimes when they did speak up, when they did say, hey, I was sexually assaulted and this happened to me, there was repercussions for that. People would come to the house, the KKK would come to the house and take the men out the house and lynch them or beat them up. So in order to protect themselves, uh, they have to stay silent and protect their families. And during this period and all the way through slavery, uh, the stereotyping of women of color really became something that was um, a justification uh, to objectify these women and also to continue the victimization. What the stereotyping did was basically shift the blame away from these institutions who have historically oppressed or caused damage um, and made it really that the individual was responsible for what happened to them, and which is the root causes of internalized oppression. And then these stereotypes today, it, it shows that people are willing participants in their own victimization. I do a lot of work um, around the country working with police departments on gender bias uh, policing and increasing their responses to sexual violence for all survivors and specifically for survivors of color. One of the things when you're looking at police reports, you can just see the biases popping up in those police reports and people um, putting their own opinions inside of these reports. And uh, when I read them, it's pretty sickening, honestly, because a lot of it is racially based, and these stereotypes about people being over-sexualized um, pop up into those reports continuously. 
And then in the media, well, we see these stereotypes with a lot of the TV shows that are present out here, a lot of the reality shows that we see, music. Uh, and one of the things that I also tell people, if your circle of individuals that you engage with uh, look like you, and this is specifically for my white colleagues, um, you cannot use social media, you cannot use uh, media, the television, um, for that to actually help you understand who people of color are, who these survivors of color are. A few years ago, I was um, with the Women of Color Caucus in Ohio at our uh, annual retreat, and we went to uh, a hotel, and it was a mishap with our rooms, and a young man was a young uh, white male who was working the front desk. And, you know, I told him, don't worry about it. It's okay. You just made a mistake. That's fine. But he just kept overly sharing that he was so sorry, he's so sorry. And I just told him, let it go. We're okay. Mistakes happen. You're human. It's fine. Um, and it's not the mistakes that define you. It's how you bounce back. I, I gave him some little speech. And then he, his reply was that, you know, we need more women of color like you in this world. And I had to pause for a minute um, and make sure that I responded, um, not from an emotionally place, but I had to respond and let him know, please stop looking at what you see on TV for who women of color are. That, what you see on TV is reality shows. That does not define us. But you have to think about when we're working in these systems where survivors engage, whether it's law enforcement, health care, you're talking about the prosecutor's office, the judges, majority of those individuals are from the dominant population, and they don't engage a lot, don't understand the culture, and make a lot of assumptions when those survivors present in front of them. So I really challenge people to look outside of these areas and really think about um, don't use this as your judgment for how survivors act when you engage with them. And then just for some other stereotypes, with regards to men of color um, in our society, we know that um, men of color have been um, identified as sexual predators over the years through slavery, um, and even today with the difference of ways of how they're treated in the criminal justice system. They're less likely to believe if they are a victim of a sexual assault, and their survivors are less likely to report to police for various reasons due to um, a lot of what we see and going on with regards to the police brutality, interracial dynamics, and just the backlash um, that they may receive for um, protecting them. And then the, sometimes the survivors who are who victims, who perpetrators, I'm sorry, are men of color, they are, have a fear of reinforcing these negative stereotypes when they do go forward to report. So and we talked about why these tar stereotypes are harmful uh, in the earlier slide, but I think what is really uh, important is shifts the blame from the institutions. Um, it allows these institutions not to be accountable at all for um, making sure that survivors of color are safe and that individuals are held accountable when they are victimized. So how do women of color seek their justice originally? I'm going to put that question out to you all. If we're talking about systems that are not equipped to respond to survivors of color, how did they seek their justice? Well, I would say a lot of people originally think that the, you know, the rape crisis movement is one way. Um, it was designed to be a fight for equality, um, and we think about that a, a movement. Uh, a movement is defined by Webster's Dictionary to an organized effort to promote or attain an end. And so many times people think about the race crisis center movement starting in the 70s, but I like to say that that movement started way before the 70s with women of color. Although you see um, not a lot of women of color in the movement today and not a lot of women of color um, in leadership positions, but women of color really led the way for this movement to start. And that started to me back with Sojourner Truth, um, Ain't I a Woman at the Women's Rights Conference, she really brought a lot of attention to the fact that women of color were treated differently um, than their white counterparts. And this was a conference that women, for women to get rights and everything, but women of color were completely left out of this conversation. 
And then in the 1866 Memphis riots, this was a time when um, in the area of Memphis, it was a huge riot. Um, black and brown folks were attacked during this riot, and a high number of women were sexually assaulted as young as the age of 14 by the individual rioters. This is one of the first times in history where we could see that women of color actually went in front of Congress to talk about their victimization and also to seek some type of changes um, and advocate for themselves and say enough is enough. And yes, some women of color did seek um, help through their faith um, and were connected to many churches. You're absolutely correct. The other thing I would say, um, even doing some work with churches, though, we have seen that uh, oftentimes because of the power dynamics within the church that women of color have been forced to go straight into forgiveness and the church wasn't always able to respond to them as well. And that's, I'm just responding to a comment that I see um, that was added. Another way is Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells is like I always often compare Ida B. Wells to our Black Lives Movement um, creators. Uh, Ida B. Wells, she really saw the connection between the state sanctions against black men and the continual rape of black women and put it together. Uh, and she was really one of the forerunners of trying to understand the connection that when one system is oppressing one in a group of individuals, that system is also going to oppress other individuals. And I think so many times in the rape crisis movement, we get very tunnel vision about the work that we do um, and kind of forget that our work is interconnected to other crimes and other oppressive factors that our society faces, especially for our survivors of color. This slide, you can't see it all the way because it's not going to uh, populate correctly um, through this format for the presentation. But I will also say that Rosa Parks, so many of us know Rosa Parks from the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Montgomery Parks was really, um, before the Montgomery Bus Boycott, she was a true advocate of sexual violence. She was going into communities of color um, through the NAACP investigating sexual assault cases and trying to get systems to hold individuals accountable. She was most notably known for the Reese Taylor case. Some of you may have been, watched that movie uh, last year. Uh, it's on Netflix. I think it's on HBO as well. But in this, it kind of highlights the work that Rosa Parks was doing with regards to uh, rape and sexual violence. Um, she was writing letters to the governor. She was going into the communities investigating, trying to speak with the perpetrators, talking to the police about the next steps that they can take, basically handing them over their investigation and saying, here's the case. You can indict. You can charge these individuals for what was going on. And then the silence continued today. So that was a really, really short history of survivors of color um, in the United States and some of the historical traumas that they have experienced. What I would like to ask for you all, um, think about how does the silence continue today for survivors of color? Where do you see survivors of color not being heard? How are systems continuously silencing them? In many communities, and we've seen this across the news. Okay, I'll wait one second. Survivors of color cannot... Survivors of color cannot trust law enforcement because of police brutality, um, not given education about sexual assault, yes. We see that often that uh, survivors are often scared to come forward because the person who sexually assaulted them was a person that they loved and trusted or another person of color. And they just want the abuse to stop and that person held accountable. But there's a fear because of the, if you go on social media at any given point in time during the course of your day, and some type of police brutality may pop up, um, and they often do not want that person to uh, have additional harm caused. They just want to stop 
the abuse to stop and accountability to take place. And yes, there is still silence within the communities of color with regards to educating and having that conversation around sexual violence. And the Me Too movement, yes, the Me Too movement, um, it definitely was started by Taryn or Black, a black woman, with regards to connecting with some of the underprivileged kids that she was working with at camp who she consistently uh, saw were victims of sexual violence to let them know they were not alone. Um, but when that movement kind of became a national movement, the stories about the women of color, it, they just got pushed to the side. And unfortunately, we see that time and time again when women of color are at the forefront they typically get pushed away from um, having any conversations with regards to what was going on and what happened to them. So I will also say what we're seeing across the country, we have seen uh, the stories about the backlog of untested rape kits. And working on the Cleveland project and working on the projects across the country with a lot of the other uh, sites that are tackling their uh, untested rape kits, I would tell you there's a high number of these kits that belong to African American women. Uh, Detroit, Memphis, and Cleveland, yes, I know that these are predominantly um, communities of color, but however, what I learned in working on some of these projects is that these ladies went to the hospital to have a sexual assault exam complete and expected to engage with police, but a lot of times their cases were open and closed and within 48 hours without anybody ever speaking with them. In these police reports, so many of them are identified as prostitutes, um, drug addicts, words like whores, uh, we deal with her all the time, she was just out tricking um, and the person didn't pay for it. All these negative assumptions are placed in these reports without any proper investigation. And what we know today, especially in Cleveland, today is that they have a high rate of um, successful prosecutions because these cases are now being fully investigated. And uh, in Detroit and Cleveland, there's a high number of individuals that are serial rapists and they commit other crimes. So allowing these individuals to continue victimization, victimizing the community allow for these perpetrators to have access to more victims. And a lot of times these ladies were sexually assaulted again and they did not come forward to report the second sexual assault because of the lack of trust from when they first reported. Now, during the same time period where these um, untested kids sat in these uh, shells of these police departments, many cases did go forward in the criminal justice system. And what we're learning that the cases in these communities that went forward were often um, not women of color. These were white women cases who were able to move forward. So it really just gives us an understanding about, in our society, who do we see as the ones that can be victimized and who do we see as the ones that can't be victimized. I think this project is really going to change how we're doing work with regards to responding and making sure we're meeting the needs of all survivors. And it's having individuals who work within these institutions um, have difficult conversations about race, uh, bias, and how to depower their biases when they pop up, when they're engaging with um, somebody that may be different from them. And this slide, it, it's it doesn't show properly, again, because of this type of format. But this is basically, you know, during the Me Too movement, uh, you heard all of these individuals come forward and make accusations against Harvey Weinstein. You had multiple ladies. However, the, he stayed silent on all of them, and only one that he came forward to talk about that, no, he didn't accuse, he didn't sexually assault her and question her accusations was the one woman of color that came forward, Lupita which is very shocking, or not so shocking. Another way where we're seeing um, how historical um, trauma is playing part, um, the Department of Justice in Baltimore, they went in to do um, a, basically a background investigations on all of the allegations of police brutality and misconduct. And what they stumbled upon, they found that within the department, 
that the Baltimore police was not doing a great job with regards to investigating gender bias, investigating sexual assault cases. Um, the detectives failed to develop in any type of preliminary investigations. They failed to identify and collect evidence to collaborate the victim's statements. They failed to collect and access the data. Um, they just really seemed like they were not doing anything with regards to the sexual assault cases and also with regards to transgender individuals as well. What I will say that this report, if you have an opportunity to read it, it will let you know that the majority of these women uh, were women of color. So this goes back to um, what I stated earlier, that if your organization is not paying attention to what's going on in your community with regards to um, police brutality, what's going on with regards to how individuals from the LGBTQ community is being treated um, by the institutions, that you are failing survivors. Because when those institutions um, oppress one, they're going to oppress many other individuals and not do what they need to do to all. Another report that I like that kind of shows the present day implications is a report, The Girlhood Interrupted, is the erasure of a black girl's childhood, which is by, um, it was created by the Georgetown Law School for Poverty Institute. Um, what they found in this report, and this is basically a survey of individuals from various backgrounds um, to just survey them to see how they feel about uh, young black girls compared to their white counterparts. And from this survey, it found that they thought that girls from about the ages of 5 to 14, um, black girls from about the ages of 5 to 14 seemed older than white girls the same age. They needed less nurturing than white girls, less protection, less support, less comfort. They were more independent, and they knew more about adult topics, and they knew more about sex. And again, this is from the age of about 5 to 14. The research shows from this uh, project that once they turned about 14 years of age, that it kind of leveled off, and they felt the same about the girls. What I think is really interesting about this is, so if you have this young girl that comes up and reports a victimization, um, how is the system responding to them if this is sort of what the research is showing that people feel this way about them? Is that social worker for Department of Children and Family Services just seeing us as a fast little girl who um, knows a lot more about topics than what she should, and so she's kind of almost victim blaming them for what happened to them? We see so many times especially with regards to our project. We have a project, a safe harbor project here in um, Cleveland. It's a program over in our juvenile court system to help uh, teenage girls who have been uh, possibly trafficked and not connected to the criminal justice system to wrap services around them and, and hopefully help them move uh, away from that trafficking lifestyle. What is really disappointing is that the majority of those young ladies are uh, girls of color and they, before they were trafficked, they had a previous history of sex abuse, which most of them ironically did disclose uh, and went through the system. Uh, it went to our Department of Children and Family Services. Uh, these young ladies were also engaged in the courts, uh, but nobody was held accountable. Oftentimes they were returned back home to their perpetrator and the victimization continued, and that's when these young ladies started leaving home because home was no longer safe, and their traffickers were able to access them because of that. Um, so when the systems are not equipped to respond to these young girls and believe them and put them in uh, safer places, uh, the victimization just continues on. But it, it makes me pause to think this research is really depressing and sad because it shows that the systems are ill-equipped where our girls um, have an opportunity when they come forward to have access to services. Services are not put in place. They are often not believed. And then they're, conti <clears throat> and then they're continually victimized, whereas their counterparts, um, things are handled quite differently. And it's, it's a huge challenge that I think as uh, rape crisis centers, as service providers, that we really need to start having a conversation on how can we hold these systems accountable to make sure that they're supporting all survivors when they come forward. And one of the ways to do that is really um, 
creating these opportunities where you're able to access the data from these systems and start do, doing a deeper dive into the data. Another report that shows for the present day implications is the sex abuse to prison pipeline, the girl's story. This report um, basically is, was by, completed by Georgetown Law Center on Poverty and Inequality as well. This really gives the data about, you hear about the pipeline to prison for young boys, the school to prison pipeline. And for girls, unfortunately, the sex abuse to prison pipeline is really there because so many times our young girls of color, um, their trauma response is seen as criminal behavior and they're forced into these criminal systems instead of into treatment. What we've seen is that there's a high percentage of girls in the juvenile justice system that have been previously sexually abused. But when you think about um, for girls of color, they make up approximately only 22% of the population, uh, but they compromise a 66% of the girls who are incarcerated. And when you read this report, what you'll also find um, in some communities is up to like 80% of the girls in the juvenile justice system have been sexually abused, and a higher percent of those young ladies have also been uh, exposed to human trafficking. We also noticed that five, black girls are five times more likely to be suspended from school, uh, three times more likely to be referred to the juvenile justice system and less likely to benefit from prosecutorial discretion. And if you're working with survivors of color, teenage girls who are possibly victims of human trafficking or who are in the criminal justice system and you have identified them as being um, survivors of sex abuse, this is an opportunity for you to educate if they have a defense attorney, if they're working with a guardian ad litem, the judge, around how their behavior may be directly um, a result of their victimization, and to challenge that uh, judge or that prosecutor to put other things in place uh, for this individual besides uh, programs that are punitive. I love the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. If you ever have an opportunity to read some of her work, she really talks a lot about how girls of color are often at the intersection of exploitation. Um, they are sexualized uh, because of their gender and also criminalized because of their race. And when you have that uh, intersectionality of being black and female or being a woman of color and a female, the chances of you being sexually assaulted increase, the chances of you not uh, being believed increases tremendously. And also just think about what type of services are being provided for these individuals in your program. Are they even showing up in your program in the delivery services? Do they stay engaged? They, they, do they show up and then not stay in your program and maybe only do one or two sessions? Really have to dive a little bit deeper and, stand and have an understanding of why that may be taking place. Survivors of color are often called difficult. I was actually in a training, um, doing a human trafficking training, and with a judge who handles a specialized docket, and this training was for new prosecutors, new probation officers who might be engaging with these youth in some form or format, and uh, basically stood up in front of the room and said that these clients and victims are going to be difficult, you're not going to like them, they're going to be disrespectful, uh, you're not going to be able to deal with them, uh, but these are the people that are charged to work with them. And I quickly, quickly had to uh, go into a place and do some re-education around what this individual just stated in a room is that they're not difficult. This is their trauma response. This is how these individuals are trying to understand if they can trust you or not because so often um, they have been failed by multiple institutions and systems before they even get in front of us and with the work that we're doing. And sometimes even women of color are often cause strong that, you know, they can handle anything. And that goes back to the generational abuse that has happened within families, within the culture, um, that they are strong, they are resilient, they will be able to um, bounce back. Early in my career, um, I am a survivor of childhood sex abuse, and early in my career I was out um, with a detective who I respected as a detective. He is a great um, investigator 
we had just finished meeting with a young um, teenage survivor of color, and when we were in the car going back to the police station, he just looked over at me. He said, Teresa, you would have never let that happen to you. You, you would have never let this happen to you. I believe her, but, you, yeah, you wouldn't let that happen to you. And I was not out as a survivor at that moment, um, and I had this, like, reaction where I was triggered. My underarm pit started sweating. I remember my stomach just started feeling, uh, I got knots in it. I started sweating all over. And I was like, how do I handle this in this moment? Because, I, like I said, I was young in my career. I just wasn't at a place where I was comfortable talking about my own survivorship. But um, I had to let him know that, though, no, that was me. That happened to me. And that no survivor just lets anything happen to them. This isn't a crime where people just let it happen to them. Uh, you know, people are victimized because somebody had power and control over them. Somebody dominated them. Um, they go into protective mode, the fight, fight, or freeze. It was like here in this moment why I'm having this reaction because of all of the things that, you know, people are told, um, told me growing up that you don't do this, you don't do that. So that's where that victim blaming come in, and people feel as though they're responsible. It kicks in, but... I see this so often that women of color are deemed the strong individuals, that they will be okay. Uh, and I just think we have to have a different conversation because we should not think that people, um, whether they have this strength or not, uh, it should not be used against them when they are perpetrated against. And we're going to transition over to talking a little bit about um, sexual assault on college campuses for women of color. Um, this is a unique area, I think, because depending on where it takes place, whether it's at a predominantly white institution or if you're talking about a predominantly black institution, that uh, some of the same things are present when a survivor of color does come forward, regardless of which institution that survivor is attending. Um, oftentimes, uh, Survivors of color are silenced because of their race and gender again. Uh, their race and gender makes them an outsider in some of those spaces on the predominantly white institutions. And then also the narrative around sexual violence and bystander intervention on these campuses target are typically around straight, cisgender, white women. Uh, the bystander intervention often does not talk about um, how to uh, help support somebody that is of different background. There's a research that was recently released, um, I think it was earlier this year, that talked about uh, how on college campuses the white women are less likely to intervene if they saw a person of color being sexually assaulted. And actually through that research, it went into a lot of victim blaming which is really a place that I think we have to change. Why do people respond to some survivors in one way? The connection um, is that if that survivor looks like me, I'm going to respond differently. Um, we just have to really figure out what's going on and how do our biases play into who do we help and who we don't help. And then on a predominantly white campus, um, survivors are, and not survivors, just people of color typically are in small communities on a campus, and if they do report, they have a fear of disrupting that little small community or having attention um, being brought to that institution, that smaller community. The other thing is if that predominantly white institution is insensitive and having conversations about race relations, uh, that survivor of color is not going to most likely trust that um, they're going to handle a sexual assault at all. And this is the report that I was talking about, the white female bystanders response to a black woman at risk for incapacitated sexually. So they are less likely to intervene. They feel less personally responsible for this uh, situation. And also for these situations, they perceive that the victim is actually um, more blaming, more, you know, responsible for their own victimization. And when you're on the college campuses, really look at your bystander interventions and see if they address race, race and ethnicity. Even through your bystander intervention programs period uh, that you may have that's not connected to a college campus, one of the things we did here with our prevention team, um, it's a great prevention team, they looked at what they were doing for bystander intervention and just looked at it through the lens of culture to see if this would fit 
for when they're going into brown and black communities where part of intervention means calling the police. Or if they do intervene, they may be seen as a snitch, and how do you get around that in communities and have that individual still be safe in that community where they told and said something against somebody that may have a little bit more of power over them. And when you're thinking about on a historically black college and university, um, there's a huge fear of protecting their perpetrator at all costs, which goes back to when I was talking about during the Jim Crow era. You know, we were taught to protect the, our men of color. Um, there's a fear of getting another student in trouble, bringing the police and attention to that group. And then also, hey, he made it to college. He's one of the good ones that made it out. We have to make sure that he continues to move forward. And so many times uh, survivors of color are silenced on these campuses for those factors. Let's skip that slide. So um, how do you all think that we can change this narrative? What can we do with our programs within the work that we're doing every day to ensure that we are able to respond to all survivors in a trauma-informed manner and understand the historical context that may be presenting when these survivors come forward or if they decide not to even come forward? I'm going to pause a minute and give people a time to kind of respond to that question. Yes, we can make our staff representative of the cultural backgrounds of survivors so they feel like they see themselves in our advocates. Yes. I think we need to move away from our first response being called the police. Yeah, I think that is really important. And when we're working with a survivor, that we really um, identify what they need from us first. Uh, so many times, Full disclaimer, when I first started as an advocate, you know, you're sexually assaulted, call the police. Um, this is what's the steps of the criminal justice system. Once you make the report, I'm going to be able to walk you through this entire process and be there with you. That may not be what that person needs in that moment. What they may need is just somebody to listen to them and help them do some safety planning and not go straight to call the police because if that happens, we could shut out a lot of survivors from even going the next step. And maybe they will get there, but the, that's not the first thing that they need to be told. Thank you for mentioning that. Are there any other ways that we think that we can change this narrative to make uh, our communities better to respond to all survivors? Yes, holistic healing options, culturally specific services through art and dance, yes. One of the things that um, there's a program up in the Detroit area, uh, Sasha, um, at Camila Johnson, is it Camila Johnson? She has a program that just unapologetically serves uh, women of color, and her services are really incorporates a holistic approach to the services. It may be, it looks so different, and I think we have to get away that everything is just sitting in a chair and having a conversation around um, what happened to people and asking them to digest their story and process it in that way. But how can you incorporate some holistic options into their healing spaces, whether that's music, dance, art? Create local communities, yes, relevant spaces for women of color and share and be well on their own terms. Yeah, so many times when we think about creating uh, support groups, we, having culturally specific support groups can be also helpful because sometimes people, um, especially women of color, survivors of color, may not feel comfortable about sharing um, in spaces that are not uh, culturally specific, uh, and that's just because experiences may be different and there's a fear of people um, judging them for their experience or not even understanding their experience or wanting to be in space with people that can probably possibly understand their experiences a little bit better. I really do like one of the first responses was, uh, and that is making sure that there is representation on the staff 
for individuals from various backgrounds because I think that is really important. And who do people see when they come inside your agency? When they go to your website, do they see themselves? Do they see pictures of people that are similar to them? What's your material, your marketing material? What does that look like? So if we think about this change in the narrative, our change in the narrative is finding a way to support all survivors um, if we can get to offender accountability but safer communities. We know when we're supporting survivors um, that our communities will definitely be safer at the end of the day. Um, we know that all survivors have this, uh, these, some of these barriers, but I just want to uplift some barriers I think that are kind of like unique and sometimes more prevalent for survivors of uh, color, uh, the self-blame. As a survivor, as I stated earlier, I could just remember growing up and I was told you don't do all of these things or this will happen to you. And so when we have those type of conversations within our culture, it leads to I didn't listen and I am the reason why this happened to me. It's something I did wrong for this to happen to me. Um, or that fear of just not being believed is, hum is tremendous. Internalized oppression, um, we're already fighting so many factors around oppression um, within ourselves. And then when you have that self-blaming, you have systems and people that don't respond correctly uh, or appropriately um, and understanding the things that's going on because of the culture dyna cultural dynamics, that internalized oppression increases tremendously. The intersectionality of race and gender um, and the intra dynamics, uh, the interracial dynamics of victimization, protecting the men, uh, not wanting to see people go to prison, uh, or a fear of people losing their lives when they go. I think we just, that is a real conversation that we have to have. The generational abuse. I see this sometimes in um, outside of uh, survivors of color, but I don't see it at the rate I do um, with these other individuals. With, and that's the generational abuse part. Sitting down with families, sometimes when you get in that, um, the family's background or trying to figure out why mom is not calling you back, why mom seems detached from the case about what's going on with their child. Uh, sometimes it's a conversation to check in with that mom one-on-one or that guardian one-on-one because uh, you might learn that that person was triggered in that moment when their child was abused. For example, um, one of my advocates uh, earlier this year had a case that she was working with. Mom was present in the meeting, the trial prep meeting. Grandmother was present. Um, grandmother was basically taken over. Uh, didn't give mom an opportunity to speak or anything. When the advocate checked in with mom 101 um, just to see how she was doing and to give her some boy, uh, ability to express her concerns, um, mom said she just couldn't function in this moment because she was confused about why grandmother didn't respond the way she is today when she disclosed her own abuse. So that generational abuse is really um, deep. And mm. when we go so quickly that mom is not protecting, mom is not trying to get her child services, I think we need to step back and reserve our judgment and maybe look at what's going on for this mom and why she is responding in the way, in the manner in which she is responding, and give the entire family services if they so choose. And as mentioned earlier, programs and systems like diversity, um, our programs, our rape crisis center programs across the country lack a lot of diversity, um, especially in communities of color in which they sit. Um, and the system, it lacks diversity. When you think about the majority of, I talked about it earlier, um, police officers, law enforcement prosecutors, judges, they are typically from the dominant culture and um, oftentimes are not even equipped to have the conversations around race and how race impacts an individual's ability or inability to engage in these systems. So I want to just go quickly over to, transition over to, um, what are some key considerations that you all can think about when you're engaging with uh, different populations of color uh, after being post-victimization? So when we're working with Native American survivors, one of the things I will say, uh, a lot of research is out here about um, what's going on with Native women, that they are going missing at an extremely high rate. Uh, there's little conversation about um, accountability and fighting these ladies. 
And so when you see that uh, one of them go missing or a sexual assault takes place, it's just not a victimization against that individual. It's actually against that community because this is happening at such a high rate without any um, body really ever being held accountable for what's going on. And then also you have to recognize how the power dynamics may impact the reporting process um, because of the colonization and the lack of trust within the system that has not been designed to protect them. Another thing, and we see this across the spectrum, um, but so often with adult victims of sexual abuse in the Native community, you would see that they were also abused as children. And so when you have that complex trauma that's happening over and over again, some of the responses may uh, increase tremendously, and that's when we saw earlier in the slides when I was talking about the statistics about the high number of Native American women that's in treatment facilities um, have been sexually victimized. So one of the things you can think about is when you're engaging with a survivor from this community, um, just think about the the traumas that they have had before the trauma that's present in front of you and how you can work with them. And if you have that child victim, what factors are you putting in place um, when you close out with that client that may help prevent future uh, victimizations and the vulnerabilities that are present? And when you're working with our Hispanic Latina survivors, uh, think about, I'm not going to go into politics here, but one of the things that we're seeing is a high number of individuals that are not coming forth for services at all because of uh, the extreme fear of deportation. And this person can be here legally, have every paperwork that they need, but sometimes um, somebody close in their family, maybe somebody that reside with them, somebody that's real close to them, uh, they may not have the correct documentation, and there's a fear that through the investigation that um, investigators will find this information out and that family member will be deported. So one of the things that uh, I looked at recently with our program is that you sometimes in programs they ask you who resides in your household. That's a question that you might think that do you really need to know all of that uh, in order to provide the services? And that may turn that person off because there's a fear that, hey, they're going to find out my, my aunt or my grandmother is here um, and they shouldn't be here and that person is going to be deported. So just little things of that nature is kind of looking through are there areas um, where it might cause that person to stop accessing your services. And then also language barriers. Um, try not to use family or friends to translate, um, but what are the language barriers that are present for these individuals in accessing services? We recently um, realized uh, that we had to change our, um, our main phone number, the voicemail, when you call. It said uh, everything in English, and then after a minute, so it went to Spanish. And so if you have somebody that is Spanish speaking, they may hang up the phone immediately and feel as though you can't help them because you don't have anybody that can translate for them. So as one of the ways you can counteract that is, is as soon as they pick up the phone, hi, thank you for calling such and such rate crisis center. Um, for English press one, for Spanish press two, you can kind of create that immediately so they can understand that you are able to provide services for them. And when you're talking about who provides the services, really looking at hiring um, culturally competent individuals. It's great if you're creating a program to have individuals from that population, from the community providing those services, uh, because if I went to school, took Spanish, and I know how to speak Spanish, that doesn't mean I'm the best person fit to provide those services for this community at all. It's really important to have that. And then also, if you have these individuals and you have advocates that are going out and providing that support when they have forensic medical exams complete, you might want to make sure that they understand the entire process of the exam and the purpose of the exam. Um, and I highlight this with the Hispanic community for um, what I talked about earlier with regards to forced sterilization, but I also highlight this because um, I've worked numerous cases where I went to the hospital to support a Hispanic Latina survivor, and it was an adult woman, but when it came time for the pelvic exam, they really shied away from that part, and they had to learn more that culturally um, from this community where these individuals were from, that they didn't do pelvic exams until after um, uh, the, the individual had a baby. And that was just something that was different for the culture, um, even though that these ladies were in their 30s. 
so really taking the time and being more thorough um, with explaining every step can hopefully help that person go forward and having the exam complete or making the most informed decision that's best for them. Uh, when you work in with the Asian specific population, recognize that um, this, like for other uh, cultures of uh, color, there's a mistrust with law enforcement. Language may not have the terminology to even describe what happened um, in their language. Also, the uh, shame and honor, how that will impact the investigation. And the hierarchical structures with the community, uh, sometimes from what I have experienced, that people have to go through the elder in the community before they can actually report and let the elder make the decision on the next steps. And then if they do decide to fall outside of whatever the elder has decided, there might be a risk of social isolation. So are you prepared as an organization and do you know who can help provide the basic needs that this individual may need if they are isolated from the community? That was providing them their initial support. It's really great um, if your organization is not able to provide all of the services, is to connect with who in your community um, is the gatekeeper for these organizations, who's already doing the great work that you can start building those relationships with. I think um, identifying them um, proactively versus reactively will be a, help you be in a better place to provide holistic support for that survivor. And when you're working with the African American um, black survivors, understand that the culture of silence and why that culture of silence exists today. And so many times uh, people don't understand that that silence has moved down from generation to generation for slavery, that the silence was there to protect the community. Uh, oftentimes you hear about people recanting and quickly it goes to that it didn't happen or that person lied. Uh, a lot of times that recantation is because of the culture of silence. That person may have been told you have to keep silent, you can't go forward, or they're protecting individuals because of financial dynamics. Uh, they're protecting individuals because it's best to almost protect that person so they can stay safe. But a recantation does not mean that it did not happen. I think we have to really get away from that uh, and understand that that silence. I actually did this training um, for uh, another community, and one of the counselors um, made a comment that when she works with African-American survivors, she knows that they're not telling her the truth. And it, I had to pause for a minute and, like, what do you mean they're not telling you the truth and, about their victimization? She said, well, they're not disclosing everything to me um, when we're in session, so I don't know how to help them. And so I said, well, I was a little bit confused because, them not disclosing everything that happened to you is not that they're not telling the truth. It's part of that culture of silence, and it might be something that you're doing or not doing that they don't trust you with their story. And so um, what I'm noticing at times is that the survivors will give bits and pieces of their story to see how that person who is providing the service will respond to them and also to see if they can trust them to respond in a manner that is understanding, in a manner that um, doesn't make them feel as though they are to blame for their own victimization, and in a manner that um, is not judgmental. And when you think about the, for the mistrust of these systems, I think it's really important for organizations when you're moving uh, survivors of color through these multiple systems that they uh, may have to engage with post-victimization, that as an organization that you have trust built with those uh, institutions and you are able to help call out times when those systems are not responding appropriately. Some other things I think is real important is that um, Welcome women of color into the movement. What, are, what is your organization doing to recruit women of color? Moving the women of color into leadership positions, that would definitely change um, how policies are written. That will change how um, programs are designed. 
And that will also show, especially if your organization sits in a community of color, that you are invested into that community. And somebody mentioned this earlier about culturally specific services. Um, look at your services. Do they meet the needs, expression of style, identity? Your marketing material, your social media pages. Are you all having conversations about some of the topics that are affecting survivors of color in your community? Has your rape crisis center, your program, um, highlighted the Me Too movement in a way that incorporates the voices of survivors of color and centering their voices? Um, has your, have you all talked about uh, Satoya Brown, who is currently in Tennessee, um, serving almost 51 years for murdering her perpetrator? A young lady. When survivors see that of uh, color on your social media, something that simple that doesn't cost a lot of money for you to do, they just say, oh, this agency, this organization, they understand the unique challenges. They understand that the systems are not designed to protect me, and that they may be in a better position to help um, provide services to me. So after talking about that, and I gave some more examples about ways that we can change the narrative, are there any other ways that come to mind for you all? So I'll ask again real quick before we move on. Are there other ways that come to mind that we can actually change this narrative? One of the things that was very helpful um, with regards to some work that uh, we have embarked on at the Cleveland Ray Crisis Center is um, really utilizing the great work of the Women of Color Network. Um, the Women of Color Network is a national organization that has been um, well, that was created to address the unique needs of women of color um, victims of sexual violence and domestic violence. Um, this organization provides technical assistance to programs. Uh, they also provide leadership and coaching for women of color in the leadership field. One of the things I really like about it is uh, we typically put people in one category of being underserved. They created a three-tier assessment with regards to actually categorizing um, the populations in your community, whether they are under unserved. Um, these are the populations that are so marginalized that your organization may not be reaching them at all. And then we have underserved uh, populations who are growing in service numbers, and these individuals have minimal access but need more services, and their approaches to the services um, need to be adjusted to meet their specific needs. And then you have inadequately served populations who may be visible or overrepresented, um, but we really need to improve our quality of services to them because we typically are giving them a one-size-fits-all and um, with disregard to all of the historical stuff that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. So I would challenge you all to go to the Women of Color uh, Network. Uh, if you go onto their page, I want to say it's on the um, right-hand corner. You'll be able to click onto the link for the three-tier assessment. There's a lot of great tools inside of there um, that really help you start digesting the data. Um, you have to, in order to digest this data, you have to be keeping data, and we all should be keeping data for grant purposes, but pull that data. Um, look at who is actually in your community, the by your population census, and then also look at who you are serving. Look at who um, has reported the victimization and use some of the national data from various programs and looking at the rate, and then categorize everybody accordingly to whether they're unserved, underserved, and inadequately served. And once you do that, I think you will realize that you probably have some populations that we have historically called underserved populations that are really inadequately served populations. And from that point, you can create some work plans on how you can, as an organization, better serve this population. And one of them is understanding 
a deeper dive. I mean, today is a great conversation starter, but really going a deeper dive into the historical context for that population of why they may be underserved, and then looking at the quality of services that you are providing them. Um, if you are able to, especially in the counseling, uh, if you're an agency, um, do they fall off after one session of counseling or two sessions of counseling? Are they falling off in your advocacy um, for services at a certain point in the criminal justice system? And if that's the case, what's going on in the criminal justice system? Do you all might need to train your partners about what's going on for them in that moment? Uh, but this tier, I would tell you, it takes a lot of time. Um, to dedicate to it, but it is worth it at the end of the day because it really helps you start identifying how you can enhance the delivery of services to, make, to meet the needs of all survivors who um, your agency may engage with. And then if you find that there's populations who are underserved, um, you could focus your outreach correctly. You could build an outreach plan upon this. Um, and if you have populations that you find that are unserved in your community, you might have to ask what's going on with that population where they don't trust you? Do they know about your services? I mean, you can really do an outreach. Um, so start thinking about your outreach for 2019, and you can use this uh, assessment tool. The other way we can have this conversation is really, you know, a lot of us, when we first came into the field, we were trained on cultural competency. Um, I would say we should probably have never been trained on cultural competency, but hey, it was a start, right? Um, really thinking about how can we ex incorporate cultural humility and cultural responsiveness in the work that we're doing with clients on a daily basis. And as, when we do that, as the impact <coughs> excuse me, that we would have um, is tremendous. Um, the impact is that we are demonstrating that cultural humility, trust is established, victims are more likely to report, they're more likely to stay engaged, they're more likely to access our services for counseling, for advocacy, for support groups. Um, and I, I go back to this, the increased offender accountability happens at the end of the day. Uh, and when that happens, because we know perpetrators continue to perp, we can actually help stop victimization when we practice cultural humility. Uh, and and I, this is the piece that I am really working with law enforcement around um, because at the, if you could talk to law enforcement, for those of you who train law enforcement, their bottom line is offender accountability. Regardless, that's their bottom line. If we can show them how to get there for all populations, they are more likely to um, accept what we're talking about. And I say that's just those advocacy or rape crisis center folks talking. But if we can show them how if you engage in practicing cultural humility, it's going to increase engagement with your victims, and it will hopefully increase that offender accountability. Um, I think we're winning with them at, if you approach it from that manner. But when we think about cultural humility and the difference between cultural competency and cultural humility is cultural to see basically means you learn something and you're done, and that you know everything about that and you're very confident you're an expert in it. Um, that is really, really hard to attain when you are not from that culture. Culture humility is an ongoing process where individuals and systems uh, respond respectively and effectively to all people, regardless of their backgrounds, their differences. Um, and you're doing this in a manner that recognizes, affirms, and values that person as an individual and protects and preserves the dignity of them. I will also say even a person that's from the culture is typically not competent of the culture because there's so many different layers of, of culture within cultures. So the, really saying that you're competent of a culture um, is not the best terminology to use, but if we are all striving um, for cultural humility, uh, then that's what we can get to. I really like the uh, hooks model. Uh, it's having a sense of one's own knowledge that is limited to what truly is another culture. It's other-oriented rather than a focus on myself. It's just having that respect for others. It lacks the superiority. It lacks um, the ability of knowing. It lacks the need to know everything. And also when you're responding from a place of cultural humility, it takes away that savior mentality, that you are actually empowering this individual um, and that you're not coming in trying to save them. 
So what does it look like putting it into practice? Uh, I like to use the SS uh, acronym is ask questions in a humble and safe manner, uh, seek self-awareness, suspend judgment, express kindness and compassion, uh, support a safe and welcoming environment. And then I think it's so important that we start where the survivor is. We typically um, try to take survivors on a journey in which we feel is best for them and not allow them to uh, be at their wheel and drive their own journey. We um, need to move away from, in order to get this, you must do that type of service delivery, because uh, sometimes that does not incorporate culture. It does not incorporate the barriers that may be present for some survivors in order to move through the process and the journey of their own healing. Um, and then I like to talk about, are you an ally or are you an accomplice? How are you showing up to do this work? I would tell you I much rather prefer for people to show up as accomplices, um, but I know we're not all there yet. So uh, showing up as an aspiring ally is okay, but how do you show up as an aspiring ally? Do you stand up for that survivor when you are in a room and people are doing some victim blaming? Do you stand up for that survivor when um, individuals are not um, doing what they need to do with regards to moving the case forward? Or do you not put that much energy in it? Do you stand up for your colleague in meetings when you know that their thoughts are um, being hijacked by other individuals and saying, hey, uh, this was Teresa originally said this, and I think we need to go forward. Um, kind of like putting that back to, it's sort of like what um, the females doing, uh, former President Barack Obama's cabinet said they had to do when they were in meetings. They noticed when one person says something, a female says something, a male would come behind them and kind of take the ideal. So they automatically went back and said, oh, that's great. It sounds just like what Shelly just stated. Um, but how do you uplift the voices of those individuals who um, are being shut down in your work that you're doing? And so I like to just look at what Webster says about an ally. Um, an ally is one who is trying to unite or form a connection or relation between individuals, um, which is great. But then when you look at what um, for Ohio and most people's uh, revised codes have something around uh, accomplice or somebody who's uh, complicit in a crime, ours basically says to aid or abet another in committing offense. Whoever violates this section is guilty of complicity in the commission of the offense and shall be prosecuted and punished as if he was the principal offender. And I bring that up to say uh, when you become an accomplice, you are just as guilty uh, as whoever you are helping push through their mission and the movement. And so if we can strive to get to that, that would be great. And when you're showing up as that ally, that aspiring ally or accomplice in the work that we're doing on a daily basis um, and dismantling the system of oppressions that don't respond appropriately to survivors, we are actually making the system a lot better for all survivors and not just the survivors of color. Because we know that survivors' experiences are not the best at times in these systems, uh, but when we aspire to really make it better for those who have been most marginalized within them, we're making it better for everybody. So while you're doing your work of becoming um, an aspiring ally, just some other ways that you can show up to dismantling these systems of oppression is really educating yourself about oppression because uh, that's what we're talking about today. Learn um, from others and listen to people who have been targets of this oppression. When um, I can give you a case example, we recently had, it was brought to my attention by my manager of victim services that um, one of our clients who's a survivor of color was talking to her therapist about how, you know, the police are going to treat me bad. She, she wasn't sure if she wanted to go forward. She's like, the police are going to treat me bad. They're going to judge me because of my past criminal record. They're not going to believe me. And instead of that counselor validating that person in the moment, what that person heard was, oh, no, they're not going to treat you like that. That's not how they operate. And this was from somebody of the dominant culture. And at that point in time, that client shut down and decided she no longer wanted to seek counseling services from that individual. 
And what that did was that person uh, was not listening to that individual. Um, they made assumptions. They looked at um, that person's experiences through their own experiences with systems and did not understand um, how valid it was for that person to, um, not valid, they didn't understand that that person really needed somebody to validate what they were saying because that was their experience and that's how they felt. And instead, it went quickly to um, becoming an expert and assuming that, oh, no, this is not going to happen to you. And so we have to let that go when we're trying to become an aspiring ally and really listen to people's uh, stories and understand how their experiences um, are their experiences. And then we have to examine and challenge it, our own prejudice and stereotypes. One of the things that I talk with um, survivors about is depowering their triggers. And I like to say well, we need to depower our biases. When we are making decisions, are we making these decisions because of our own assumptions about the individual? Are we making these decisions because of our prejudice that we may have? So um, really thinking about the decisions that you make in your um, own work that you do, um, one of the things uh, you could do when you're doing that is uh, create equity primes. Equity primes are great little reminders about, um, you know, if we create this program, Will the most marginalized people be able to access it? Or how will this impact individuals of communities of color? How will this impact the individuals from the LGBTQ community? Um, if we uh, decide to go forward with this hiring of this individual, will that help us increase our ability to provide services better to these communities? Uh, if you need some equity prime questions, I can definitely send them to you all through um, Josie, but equity primes will be a way to help you uh, just think about the work that you're doing on a daily basis. Another thing I will say is when you're becoming an aspiring ally and for the supervisors that may be um, on the phone, on the line, how are you looking at progress notes and the work that your clients, your staff members are doing? Do you challenge um, when they say this client uh, doesn't want services, this client is not engaging um, or not being cooperative? Are you challenging that and looking at the data to how, who are the clients that they are typically saying this about? And think about how can you do some training around that um, and show up in that aspiring allyship role. So when we're doing this work, I just want to remind us, um, working um, this anti-oppression work is lifelong work. It's not something that we can fix overnight, but I do believe that it's something we can fix and it starts individually. Um, when you start doing the inner work, you are better able to respond um, to per people on an interpersonal level, and then at that point in time, we can start doing the institutional work. So many times uh, in this field, we quickly want to go to fix the institutions, and when we do that, we cause more harm than good. So I would challenge you, instead of going quickly to um, trying to fix the institutions, really start doing the inner work within yourself um, and then your work with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis or in a group basis before you go to the institutions. You cannot fix um, what is broken without understanding where you sit with certain things personally. So at this point, I am going to open it up to questions. So if anyone has questions, please type them in the chat box. I will read, no, you cannot view other people's comments, but I will read the questions um, out loud and comments out loud. Yes, Jocelyn, I will share the equity primes. I think the equity primes are good for you to utilize um, not only in the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but also with regards to um, your interviews, when you're interviewing people for new roles and positions in the organization to incorporate those equity primes. Uh, some other things that I didn't mention that you also could do to really make sure that your organization is um, connecting and staying on the forefront of some of these topics related to survivors of color. Um, 
we created at the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center a social justice committee, and this social justice committee is really uh, designed to look at all the intersection, alley, intersections of crime and uh, how these factors impact our survivors. Because like I stated earlier, so many times we get tunnel vision and we're only focused on sexual violence, but it really gave us the opportunity to start looking at other things that was going on. And then it went from, like, this is a Teresa's uh, issue to, like, this is an agency issue, that a community-based issue that we should all be looking in and paying attention to. We also created an um, Equity Inclusion Council, and that really was a focus on us of talking about doing the internal work as an organization so we can make sure that we are able to provide work uh, better externally. Because if your organization has internal issues with regards to uh, having conversations around race, um, oppressive factors, um, dealing with different populations, um, then you really uh, – to me, in my opinion, um, do a disservice by trying to do external work. Can we give a really good example of ways to avoid cultural discrimination, especially with persons of color? Hmm. One of the ways you can avoid um, culture discrimination is to just, I see this quite a bit, is to assume that everybody from the culture, um, that all uh, black, brown individuals it, have the same shared experiences. We really need to look at um, understanding the context of historical trauma, but understanding the context of individual trauma as well. People oftentimes get lumped into one group and category, and we don't um, look at the individual that's present in front of us. Another thing that I would tell you that uh, a lot of organizations are moving away from, just to eliminate the power uh, dynamics between service providers and the individual providing uh, that's assessing the services is removing your degrees and stuff off of your office walls. I mean, those are great. They're great accomplishments for individuals, but that client that's in there, they can see that as a barrier um, that you might not be able to connect with them. A person asked, uh, will the slides be available uh, for review later? Uh, I will not be uh, sharing the slides publicly, but however, you will be able to access this presentation again um, because it's being recorded and the host will make it available online in the near future. Questions. So how about I put this question out there to you all? Um, so some of this information may not be new for a, a lot of you, uh, depending on where you are in your career or um, your background. What things do you think you can do um, going forward in your organization uh, with regards to improving the quality of services that you provide to survivors of color?
So the question was, what do you think you can do or your agency can do to make sure you are providing um, the best services to survivors of color? I would say one of the things that you definitely can do if you have survivor, I mean, if you have uh, staff that's uh, people of color, especially women of color, and your state coalition has a woman of color caucus, support them in t attending those meetings, um, give them the opportunity and the space to be present um, in circles and spaces with other women of color. Uh, in this movement, it is needed, uh, that support. Also, um, what are you doing to mentor those individuals internally in your organization uh, and to retain them? What we're seeing across the institutions is that many people are um, leaving these organizations because they uh, are not uh, a fit with the organization. I think we need to go away from um, saying that uh, people are not fit and look at them being an ad to the organization's culture a cultural ad. This person is going to bring um, something new that we need. Uh, yes, the marketing materials that represent the community service, having images and specifically discuss holistic healing services. That's another good one. Um, just imagine walking into an organization and you're opening up the flyers and looking at all of the pamphlets after the intake and you see all these beautiful faces, but it's not one face that represents a skin tone that's familiar to yours. One community has an emerging leaders cohort that allows women of color to have resources and access to leadership opportunities within our organization to have more individuals that represent our community. That is really great. What community is that? Because that sort of sounds like um, the uh, women of color caucus that I know some uh, communities have. Yes, Michigan. Michigan has a great um, Women of Color Caucus Network. And one individual um, doesn't personally uh, do direct service work uh, with survivors, but work at education and prevention. So this is for all of you prevention specialists on the online. Um, they will be using this information to better inform how to work with students of color. Um, to begin with, we do de-escalation workshops. And we need to discuss with our students why white women are less likely to help a black woman in trouble and recognize the implicit bias behind that. Um, is there any, is there something else we can be doing? That's a great start. Uh, I do think when you're talking about prevention, you have to have the conversations about um, implicit bias as well in those conversations. So many times we have the conversations around when we're providing the direct services, but we kind of leave that conversation out when we're doing the prevention work. Rochelle is sharing with us that a new prevention curriculum was developed. It's called It's Your Business, um, and it was created by HBCU and meant for people of color. Thank you, Rochelle, for sharing it. That's a great resource. I earlier this year did some, um, for our state coalition, I did some site visits with the um, with our rape crisis center programs, uh, just to be seeing they're meeting the standards. One of the things that one of the programs was talking about how hard it was for them to find um, evidence-based curriculum to use, and I encourage people, like, start your curriculum and make it become evidence-based. Do the research component of it. Um, create it, because if we are steadily looking for stuff that's out here, we, it's hard to find things that are um, culturally uh, specific. Um, there's a, not a lot of resources, unfortunately, so sometimes we have to be the lead in creating uh, the resources that we need. The other thing that we did, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, I think it's really a, a unique opportunity. Uh, we are embarking on extending our services um, onto uh, what we call the east side of Cleveland, which is in um, a predominantly black community. Um, we have created a community advisory board 
because I am a big proponent of not going into communities and thinking we know what they need, but to bring the community in to us and listen to the community, and we will design um, programming around that, um, what hours do we need to be open, it's, and that's one of the ways that you can build trust with the community. Although I am a woman of color, I don't want to be the spokesperson for everybody of color and saying this is what they need. So creating those community advisory boards uh, has been extremely helpful for us recognizing um, outside of the barriers that we have identified that even if we may eliminate the barrier of access, there still are going to be uh, barriers for those individuals to access us um, due to the fact of us being so closely connected. Uh, we did the same thing for um, our Hispanic Latino community uh, through uh, our program Hogar Casuelo, and we got so much information from um, those individuals from the community. We were able to learn that the name of the program was not actually um, a name that survivors would connect to. Um, we, uh, they gave us opportunities for outreach um, and say these are the gatekeepers of the community that you need to identify with um, and make sure you build a relationship with. And they gave us opportunities also um, to be in spaces that we typically would not have been in had we not went to the community. And if you're hosting this and you create a community advisory board for special populations um, in the, your service area, what I will say is um, host the meetings in the community um, somewhere um, where individuals are already accessing services, and then make sure you create those community advisory boards um, and have, uh, when you create them, have diverse uh, individuals from that community um, sitting at the table. You don't want just all of the people that are in leadership roles. You definitely want to have the youth voice. You want individuals um, from different socioeconomic backgrounds sitting at the table because, again, within the culture, there's so much diversity. You want to see, you may not be able to get every voice, but you want to get multiple voices. And if you're interested, I can send you um, some of the formatting and things that we did to start that as well. And I see a couple yeses. That is a yes to the information about community advisory boards, I assume. I'm taking notes so I can make sure I send everything to Josie. And yes, Rochelle uh, mentioned that there is some community, some evidence-based curriculum that has been de uh, developed for the Native American uh, population as well. Uh, she says there's some resources out there. We just got to find it, take the time to do some research, basically. But uh, in the prevention world for you all, for the prevention specialist folks, um, there's some additional resources available. And I will also say that another thing that you can do uh, internally, uh, if your staff is really trying to have these conversations outside of something like a social justice committee, what do you do uh, in your team meetings, the staff meetings? How can you incorporate having these conversations um, where they're more organic, where you can have a, um, a reading, the reading or article? One of the things that we're doing also after the first year, we're encouraging people to listen to the podcast serial. Uh, it's actually um, about the court system here in Cleveland uh, this uh, season uh, and just identifying um, all of the uh, isms that are coming present in that podcast and how we connect that back to the trainings that we have uh, facilitated over the last year and a half and how does this type of stuff impact our clients that's moving through this system. It's really um, ways to get people to have that conversation on a deeper level and to start thinking and looking at it from a different lens, especially uh, when people may not be comfortable about having a conversation about oppression and race and intersectionality. No, I was not interviewed uh, for serial season three. Uh, I just those are a lot of my former colleagues uh, from the prosecutor's office. So it's been a very interesting listen.
some other ways that you can do um, to just make your office space um, more welcoming to all cultures is walk through and see if other cultures are represented in the pictures that you hang in your office, um, the color scheme, uh, the artwork. Is the office very bland? <laughs> Does it incorporate other uh, cultures into what people may see when they're walking through and sitting in the spaces? Uh, it could be as simple as the pillow, a picture. So I'm going to ask one more time, are there any other questions? Okay. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank so you. That concludes our webinar for today. And I thank everybody for your participation and the great questions and resources that you all provided as well and recommended. Um, we'll be talking soon. There will be a recording for today um, of today's webinar, and it will be out probably next week. Okay? You can check our website for those. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again, Teresa. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Bye.